Thank you for joining us today. We've got a terrific panel of brilliant women who are going to give you some fantastic insights. Um, just briefly, I'd like for each of us to introduce ourselves, please. And um, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, everybody here looks seems to be a woman. Um, uh, it, while you're introducing yourself, if you could tell us... Um, what is it about you um, that you believe is successful? So you might for two minutes be telling me about what you do now, about what you've done in the past, or why um, you have been indeed a minority. Let me, let me kick it off because this makes no sense. Okay. Hi, I'm Dr. CJ. Um, you heard the intro just now, but you may also like to know that I have a doctorate in business administration from Harvard Business School. I'm a chairman and CEO of a not-for-profit corporation, spent a bunch of time as an entrepreneur. And one thing that makes me a little unusual is that I'm a woman in tech. Not only that, I was a woman in tech in the 80s when this was seen to be an unusual thing. Over to you, Mukta, and then you other two ladies. Hi, everyone. I'm Mukta Arya. I'm the CHRO for APAC for Societe General. It's a corporate and investment banking organization, uh, and I'm based out of Hong Kong. Um, I have been with the bank for 16 years in uh, Mumbai, Hong Kong, Singapore, and back to Hong Kong. So what makes me uh, successful is uh, just navigating the corporate world for a long time, different uh, locations, cultural diversity, and here I am, still happy and smiling. You're still alive. Congratulations. This is good. <laughs> and we're glad you're here. Sue, let's go over to you. I'm the CEO of the Arabian Club. And you know, one of Sue big, Sue's big challenges is not that she's a woman, rather it's her connectivity. Um, Sue, can we try again? Hear me now? I, I got you right now. Let's see if it continues. Yeah. Wait. Uh oh. Um, speaking as a woman in tech, Sue, I wonder if it would help if you turn off your video just for a little while. Can we try that out? Take it away, Sue. Sorry to do this, but um, thank you. Sue has just put in the private chat. Okay, I will bow out, but if you can contact Fez, our brilliant behind the scenes person, he might be able to uh, help you connect, um, maybe move to a different location. Thank you, thank you, Sue. Um, how about Rashi? Excellent, well, we'll hope that Sue comes back. But yeah, I'm I want Sue to come back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, we, we'll see. We'll, we'll wait for her for a bit, but I'm, I'm happy to get, get started. Nice to meet everyone and, and good morning. I'm, I'm dialing in from, from Paris. It's a bit early for me, so my brain's still just kicking right in right now. It's 7.30, 7.45, um, but really happy, really happy to be here. My name is Rashi Sika. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the vice president of global diversity, inclusion, and accessibility at Ubisoft, where um, we're a fairly large uh, game developer, um, global game developer. We make video games um, for um, millions of players around the world. Um, let's see. I think what makes me successful is my ability to, to listen, um, to connect, and then to make connections. This works, absolutely. So now, okay, the two of you are cornered and I've got to ask you your journey. Okay, you're here because you're women and you're successful and you've done some amazing things. Um, 
how did you navigate your journey to success? Can I start with Mukta? I think um, for me, the journey to success, it was not like something which is like, you know, pre-planned and, and something which I had milestones, etc. It was based on what I believed in. And, and that for me was quite important that did I stick to my values? And I think the first thing for that is to really identify what my values are. And this really helped me that if I felt that I need to be honest, I need to be sincere in what I do. I need to make sure that whatever I do, I will not deviate from these values that I hold true to myself, to my heart. I, I think it did help me because it means that I believed in it. I did work, which was in that narrow lane, which was there. And the other thing that really helped me in my journey to where I am right now after 25 years of my corporate career is really to have an open mind and experimentation mind. You know, I think that was really important because if I did not think that what others are saying can also be of value, if I always thought that I am right and, and mm -hmm. what I do is right always, then I would not have been able to be here. Now, just to give you an example, it's because I'm in HR. And within HR, as uh, some of you may know, there are variety of things. So you have generalist, you have compensation, you have ta talent development, etc. At one point of time, I was always thinking that I should be HR generalist so that I can become, you know, a HR head at one point of time, etc. But then in between, uh, I did experiment with going into training and development. And this was a big one because it means that I'm losing my career path and going into a specialist field, which will delay my becoming a HR head by some time. But it was the best thing that ever happened because it gave me a deep knowledge of training and development, talent development, diversity and inclusion. And those six years that I was totally de dedicated to talent development, diversity and inclusion really gave me a different perspective to human resources. And when I became a HR generalist again, I was looking at things from a very different perspective. And I would not have done it if I was an HR generalist throughout because I would be a jack of all trades and master of none. You know. So again, I think this is just an example where I feel that experimentation does help. Sometimes serendipity does help. Sometimes when you go with the flow, it does happen. So for example, I was in India in Societe General, head of HR there. My boss asked me if I would be interested in a talent development role in Hong Kong, which is an Asia Pacific role. I was thinking about it because I was like, I'm doing well in India. I have my family, you know, I have my friends here. I don't want to go there. But then what happened was that I broke up, um, you know, with my um, with my boyfriend at that point of time. And then I was like, let me look at something else which will change my life completely, you know. And that was the turning point. I accepted the offer and it was a it was a complete different change to my life, to my career, but everything actually. And again, so sometimes everything that is planned may not end up, you know, in the right situation, but sometimes things which drop by from the sky or they are completely off the cuff, it can really lead you to ways which are amazing. And I, I'm very happy about the decision that I took at that point of time. Brilliant. So, so if you feel inspired, you know, whether you're a man or a woman or whatever, go for the inspiration. And if things are opening up around you, go for it and go ahead and be flexible. I think that's, you know, one of the things that I've seen about women's careers and women's life changes, that they have a little extra flexibility um, to be doing that. And that can spell success. Rashi, uh, how did you navigate your journey to success? A lot of what Mukta spoke about definitely resonates, you know, with me, the piece around values and, and, and taking risks. Um, so add to, to, you know, what Mukta shared, I've had a fairly non-conventional, non-linear career path. You too. <laughs> yes, me too. Um, if, if anyone looks at where I am today, they, they might assume that I've had a very, you know, structured path to leading up to where I am, but it's absolutely not. I, I currently lead uh, diversity, inclusion, accessibility for a fairly large global organization. I started my, my career in television. 
right? So how does someone go from making TV shows to leading DI, diversity, inclusion, accessibility at a, at a global organization? So there's a lot that happened in between um, that, that journey. Um, and I moved from, you know, being in a operations, marketing, production, production role to operations and marketing, launching a big tech company in, in India to moving to, to gaming. And all of that happened because I was open to taking risks, right? I was open many a time to taking sometimes what would be considered a step back to move a few steps forward. So, you know, my, my career path hasn't been always the easiest. It didn't always make sense, especially to people around me. Uh, you know, why are you leaving this to do that? I, it doesn't compute, it doesn't add up. But sometimes there are moments, pivotal moments, either in your, you know, a combination of your personal and professional life that sometimes lead you to, to making certain decisions. Um, sometimes they're not calculated. Sometimes they're not strategic, but they happen, right? As, as uh, Mukta said, they, they happen to you. Um, but one of the things that I've learned in that, in that moment is to surround yourself with um, a group of individuals who, you know, I, I read this article a couple of uh, months ago, your personal board of directors, right? People who inspire you, who push you, who call you out when you're, you know, going down that spiral hole and, and make you see, see reality. So I've been fortunate enough to have, you know, those, those folks around me throughout my career and those people have moved in and out of that role of being on my on my board of directors, um, depending on the life stage that I've been at and the career progression and the stage in my in my professional journey that I've been at. Brilliant, brilliant. So life is what happens when you're making other plans, <laughs> and I'm thrilled that you're into diversity and inclusion, which is now apparently DEI. They didn't want to call it DIE for obvious reasons. Um, you know, there's an equity component that I'd like to get into in a little bit. So I'd like to talk some about diversity and inclusion and equity. But before we get into your uh, organizational issues, both of you, Fez is in the background and he has a fantastic slide, a PowerPoint thing. Sorry, we couldn't make it through a whole session without a PowerPoint slide. Uh, it's only one, don't panic. Um, this slide is from IBM. It's from the Women Leadership and Missed Opportunities Department. No, that's the title, sorry. Um, it's from the IBM Institute for Business Value and it shows us the pipeline and we start off, and if Fez, if you can flip up that slide, I would be super grateful. Do you want me to share the first one? No, just the last one, please. Okay, so um, it's, a, it's a pretty damning pipeline. Let's have a look. You know, we start off with U.S. college age workers, U.S. as an example. Um, women are 50%. Then we get into the Junior Professional League, and we've got stats from 2019 and 2021. So when we get to Junior Professionals, 37% are women. Okay, like where did they go? What happened? And this story has gotten worse in the following two years. Then we get to senior professional and some of the women have dropped out. Middle managers, no, there's a smaller number. Senior managers, oh no, they're they're dropping like flies. Vice president and director, we're, we're down to 19 and then 15% women. Then we go to senior vice president, even worse. Um, and by the time we get to the C-suite or the executive board, we're only talking about 10 or 8% of the composition of these teams being women. As a matter of fact, Harvard Business Review t tells us that the, of the Fortune 500 companies, 8% are led by women. And if we're talking about women of color, I was so happy to hear the talk of the lady just before us. We're talking about 1%. Okay, let's do the math. That's five women worldwide. Oh my God, out of 7 billion people. So I would like to spend a little time talking about number one, why does this happen? And number two, how can we make this not happen? You know, do you guys have some insights? So my first question, thank you. You can take the slide away. I think everybody has done their screenshot. 
I should have put, put a little source thing right at the bottom. Um, let me ask. Let me ask you this then. What were the organizational inhibitors and enablers that you faced getting to where you are, and how did you handle them? Let me open it up and not pick favorites. Whoever wants to talk, please talk. So, so just to understand your question, um, Dr. CJ, um, are you asking within our careers what were our organizational inhibitors? Your personal story, yeah. your career, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm happy. I... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, Rashi. Go no, ahead. No, no, go ahead. Okay, um, uh, for me, I would talk first about the uh, the uh, facilitators or the things that really helped me to grow in my career. Uh, I think uh, it's it's basically supporters, you know, people who are my uh, my mentors, my managers who were my supporters. And on the flip side, I did have a manager who was uh, really not my supporter, and it really helped me, uh, you know, uh, feel like. Um, like I cannot make it in the world. My self-confidence was down. So, you know, it can go either way. So if you really have good managers, proximity managers, your immediate managers who can help you to grow, show trust in you and give you, you know, opportunities to grow, then it really works. And it really worked for me because I had in most of my organizations, I've had managers who were like this, you know. But I do remember my first job and my first immediate manager, it was... It was really something which could have killed my career and maybe, you know, put me off HR forever. Uh, but luckily, it didn't happen. So I think that's very important, your proximity manager, because your super boss can be very nice, but they are not there with you on a day-to-day -day thing. You know? So that, that's quite important. The second is culture. And, and culture is uh, talked about quite a lot. But the way people really behave when there are, you know, decisions made for <coughs> success planning for promotions to put people really in key positions i think the culture is important if the culture is something which is related to equality meritocracy etc you will see it you know where people will not even talk about whether there's a gender uh, difference or not you know it this will not even come into the picture but if the culture is centric towards you know or biased towards one of the gender then it can really create havoc. Now, for me, luckily, I worked in Indian organizations and I have worked in multinational organizations. So it's uh, it's SR, it's uh, Ogilvy and Mather, as well as Societe Generale. So they're different kind of, and Tata TD Waterhouse. So there are differences, uh, you know, in time in terms of culture. But I think what really worked was for me was that that in the organization there was actually no bias between genders. And that really helped in my career. Now, people may say that in HR, there are mostly women. So, you know, it's not that difficult if you look at it. It's not true. Huh? I mean, even uh, in, in professions like HR and communication, uh, even though there are more women, you still have to be good at your job if you want to grow. You know, it's not like you just and if you want. Because... And are the people in charge of those departments women? Or is it a bunch of women working, but it's the guys in charge? It depends because I had a mixed kind of thing. So there were males and there were females, you know, which were there. So I think that culture is quite important. And it comes from whether it is an ad hoc kind of culture or whether it's like an institutionalized, uh, you know. So for me, for example, if it was, it was based on meritocracy and then it worked, you know. But in um, some departments, uh, you may have some people who are really biased and that can really inhibit the growth of, women in the organization, you know? So for me, I think that is, uh, these two things are very important. And the third thing is really, uh, the it's linked to culture, but the meritocracy part of it, because that is very important. If there is nepotism, if there is, for example, biasness from the top, this will really impact the way anybody can grow in their career, not only women. So for me, I think I have been lucky that I did not face it, but I had seen it in some parts, you know? but it did not impact me directly. And I think this really helped me to grow in my career without getting burnt or bruised, you know, on the way. So um, uh, maybe it's luck uh, uh, and, and I'm very thankful for that, but it's also my managers who supported me and maybe shielded me from some of these things which were happening. You know, when I was junior, I didn't realize it, but now when I was growing in my career, I did realize there's little, little things 
can make a lot of difference to somebody's career. Absolutely. So you, it, so it sounds like no complaints. You've been pretty happy with your environments. You don't feel the organization was pushing you aside or pushing you down. Uh, I, I did not face it personally. Uh, there mm -hmm. were some cases where, you know, in some departments, people did feel it. So that's why I feel as an organization, if that is not taken care of, it can kill a career yeah. of a lot of women. Yeah. So let me shift over to Rashi, and then we've got a couple comments and questions from the audience. Rashi? Excellent. Um, I, I have a slightly different perspective to, to Mukha, oh, and I'm not good. necessarily from a personal point of view, but some of it is drawn from my lived experience and then what I see as a diversity and inclusion practitioner. Um, you know, there are, on an individual level, there's always internal motivators, right, that, that propel you forward or, or pull you back that we, we all have as, as, as individuals. And then there are external uh, inhibitors or enablers, as, as you called it, um, right, that are at, at an organizational level. It could be individuals, it could be your manager, it could be, you know, a director in your organization, a senior leader. But it's also structures, the policies, the practices, the culture that exists in, within an organization that that either enable individuals to to move forward and to progress and reach their highest potential, whatever that might be for them individually. And there are others that that don't allow for that to happen, um, especially for people who might be underrepresented in the organization or people who don't necessarily look like everyone else or who don't have the same backgrounds, same cultural backgrounds. So, you know, I, 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 I like the idea of meritocracy. I don't believe it exists. I think meritocracy is a, is a nice ideal to, to, to have in our minds. We can try. We try, but it's the, the fact that even today, um, you know, when, when, uh, when you, you can pull up any job description right now in, in the market, right? I would say going out on a limb here, eight out of 10 will ask for a certain kind of degree, right? Even for a role that doesn't necessarily require an MBA or, you know, a certain kind of qualification. So we say meritocracy, you know, is, is, is something that we aspire for and we, we believe in, but it doesn't necessarily always translate at an organizational level. Um, so if I, if I pull that back to myself, right, as, as an individual, going back to your, your first question, your, your original question, um, I've been really fortunate, you know, in my, in my career to have, you know, great people who surrounded me and who believed in me and saw my potential and helped me along my, my journey. I was also fortunate that as an individual, I was uh, I'm fairly confident. I'm a risk taker. I don't get afraid with ambiguity, um, you know, so it, it helped me. Right. But not everyone is is like that. Right. And not everyone is surrounded by by people who believe in them and who propel them forward. So what can what can organizations do for that? Right. How do organizations remove barriers for people who don't fall into that bucket? of whatever is, 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 is the norm. So, you know, I, uh, I, I think, you know, this, we're, we're speaking to uh, a large group of people who are in different stages, you know, of their career and have had their own, um, you know, journeys so far. Um, but the way I try and think about it, and this is one piece I can pass on is what are your internal inhibitors and enablers and how do you, how do you identify those and how do you work, um, to put that you know out on the table and work from there and then how do you identify what's what exists in your organization and how do you if if you're not a leader who has the same influence uh, who has the influence in the organization to make change happen at that systemic level how do you elevate those concerns to your leadership so those changes are put on the table and, and changes are, are are made and if you're a leader you better get to work right and yeah. and, and build an organization that is is truly inclusive of, of all people. Brilliant. So it, now we've got a, a wonderful comment from Pearly Tan, um, who shares with us that she moved from journalism to leading content uh, at a private bank. And um, it's the openness and curiosity towards the unknown that is absolutely key. And that fits in beautifully with what Mukta said. Um, 
you know, I, it seems to me like we're being all too nice here. You, you guys are talking about the positives of organizations. I want to know why we get down to 10 and 8% and all the women have dropped out. Um, and if it's not organizational factors, maybe it's non-organizational factors. Before we go on to that question, um, uh, Meredith D'Angelo did have a question. Mokta, you spoke about the role a manager can play in supporting your career. And then you had one that was not so good. Um, what's your advice for succeeding despite an unsupportive manager? Both of you, I'd love to see what you say. Okay, so um, it's difficult huh? if you have an unsupportive manager. And I can tell you, I have gone through that phase where um, um, you want to just quit, you know, when, when you, your manager is not supportive because there are a variety of ways your manager can make your life miserable you know, day to day and you don't want to come to come to work. I think the psychological safety part uh, is, is quite important at that point of time. Um, yes, if the person is unsupportive, it is difficult. I think it also depends on organization. And I was just speaking to one of my colleagues that in matrix organizations, when you have multiple stakeholders that you work with, it becomes actually much easier because different people interact with you. And then if somebody says that you are not good, there are other people who might say that you are good, you know? So I think you have that kind of checks and balances in a matrix organization, which is much better than where you're only reporting to one manager and nobody else knows what you do, you know, except your manager. So if they say you are good, you are good. If they say you are bad, you are bad, you know, that kind of thing. So there are, so I think that becomes quite important. What kind of organization are you working in? If you're working in the letter, I, I'm afraid I don't think there is any way out because uh, the best way is to really get out and, and you know, don't waste your time there. That's what will be my advice. In in other situations, I think if you are resilient, they, you can maybe talk to the manager and try to understand. But if it doesn't work, frankly, we are not trees. Huh? We can move away. So this is what I would do. Your manager support is extremely important in your growth in an organization. Yeah. Uh, some people try to do in matrix organizations with other things. But, you know, if I'm your manager and I'm responsible for your performance review, your growth in the organization and all. And if I really don't believe in you and I don't support you, frankly, I don't think I think it's a dead end. You know, so please move out. That's my advice, Meredith, to you on this. Rashi, what are your thoughts? Um, it's hard, right? Like, as Mukta said, it's, you know, having a supportive manager is, is really important in, in an organization for your, for your growth and your development. Um, the first advice is have a conversation, right? Um, you have to put it out on the table and have an honest and, and open dialogue with, with your manager. Um, one where you're not assuming, but asking questions, right? Approaching it from that lens of, of curiosity and saying that explicitly so that they're entering the discussion with that uh, that lens as, as well. Oftentimes, or, or sometimes you might, uh, you might experience that there might have been a, um, a, a difference in understanding or expectation, right? When you have that honest and open dialogue. So I think the first piece with anything, right? When you're having a, a breakdown in, in some form of way is to, is to have, a, have a conversation. If that doesn't work, and if you've charted out a plan, right, which is what most managers would would do, when you when you go to them with, this is not working. I need something different from you. Let's put a plan together. You have a plan. The plan doesn't work. Um, I, I agree with Mukta. You know, you're you're not tied to that necessarily, even though at times we feel like we are, and there's no there's no out. But in most cases, there's always there's always a way out, right? I think another thing that always works is influence doesn't always have, have to happen in one way, right? You can influence in change and you can influence decisions by leveraging other stakeholders in an organization. So it could be your peers, it could be, you know, a, a stick level, um, it could be a stakeholder. So that's another way to also oftentimes influence some, some change. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that I, that I would add as well, um, is, uh, yes, have that conversation directly, but you've also got a community around you. At least most workers do get some support from them. Um, if you need to go around your manager or up even further, there are ways to do it, even though that can be tricky and you can piss people off pretty badly by doing that. 
Um, another thing is don't only have an internal network of guidance and support, also have an external professional network. And research shows actually that women have more external network than men do. And when women change jobs, that one year getting adjusted, trying to be productive period, women are faster on the uptake because they bring their networks with them. They don't have to build a new network inside the organization. Um, you folks may have noticed. Oh, and so there's also things like um, 100 coffees. That That's a program you can do your, put yourself on or um, take throughout your organization, which is a mentorship and uh, community building thing. There's also things like Tiger Hall, whereby you can build up mentorship and, and community externally to your organization. Why is that useful? Because you may not want to look stupid in front of the people inside your organization. So you want those external contacts. Um, some of you may have noticed that we have been joined by Michael Jenkins, who does not appear to be a successful woman. <laughs> Although That's he does true. appear to be a successful person, <laughs> otherwise he wouldn't be here. Um, Michael, can we invite you to make some comments on what's gone before, or shall I hit you with the upcoming questions? Please feel free to hit me with the upcoming questions. I'm also interested to sort of contribute a little bit on on that networking question you were just talking about. But yeah, as 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 you like, CJ. Please contribute away. Well, I was just thinking as you were talking there that uh, there's a very interesting area of research which is into something called uh, weak tie networks. Ah, um, good stuff. And it's yeah, and it's been something that's um, uh, promoted by a gentleman called Mark Granovetter, and he sort of um, uh, coined the phrase weak to weak tie networks in contrast to what we might call our strong tie networks. And it's a fascinating area because typically, you know, when we're going to look at uh, generating new ideas, um, particularly for innovation, for instance, um, we typically go to the same sources of information, namely our strong tie networks. And Mark was advocating for us trying to sort of think more expansively and more creatively about networks that might not be so obvious to us, that, that lie outside. So you made the point about external networks and women being um, at maybe quite a, a, a favorable advantage there in terms of perhaps having stronger weak tie networks than men possibly have. And I was just thinking that could be a, a very interesting um, uh, seam of um, discovery to sort of look at as to how that might also augment people's um, uh, networks. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So hopefully we've addressed some of Victoria Sanchez Terry's um, uh, issues and, and comments. I'm going to hold off on responding to comments and then hit you guys with some other questions such as non-organizational inhibitors and enablers. What are the non-organizational inhibitors and enablers you faced and how did you handle those? Jump in at will. By the way, Mukta's already been peppered with these questions like last week and then poor Michael and Rashi are just doing this on the fly. But <laughs> thank you for being game. You're welcome. Anybody jump in. It's an informal session. Right. I, I think we, we spoke a little bit about non-organizational mm -hmm. as well, you know, individual inhib inhibitors and enablers. Um, I, I, I think I, I, I spoke about that a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think <laughs> if I reflect on, you know, the graph that you, you shared right now, right, of the pipeline mm -hmm. of, um, of, of, of women talent and, and where that lands, Right. Eventually, when you look at C-suite executive roles and, and board roles, um, there there's a place there's there's a topic there that's oftentimes discussed about um, you know key pivotal moments in in women's lives that leads them to drop out of the, the workforce. Right. Um, I that's a fact. That's a reality. Right. That that um, you know people have families and and you know oh oh oh. Oh, right. so that sounds like a non-organizational issue that weighs more heavily on the women, right? Doesn't exactly. It? So that's that's kind of what I'm 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 coming to, right? But I'm yeah. reflecting on the graph that you you you, you shared, yeah. um, you know, yeah. so that we can have we can link back to that because I think it's an important topic for to discuss. Um, so yeah, so so people have families, right? Um, 
it's not just the women, right? Everyone, uh, you know, people in general have, have families regardless it, of their identity, right? At um, least more than 50% of the time it takes a mother and a father to make a child. Parents do to make a to make a child, to be inclusive of our LGBTQ plus colleagues as, uh, and team members as well. Yes, there's um, about 72 of those. Anyway, go ahead, sorry. Sure. Um, so, so the point being that, you know, life changes happen, important pivotal moments in people's you know, journeys. And those are, those are realities, those are, those are facts, right? But if we, if we talk about something as simple as parental leave um, policies that may exist both at an organizational level, but also at a country level, what, what, the, what the government you know, determines as fair and equitable or equal, um, varies, right? Um, you're seeing more and more organizations um, in, in, in the last, I want to say, two to three years roll out more equitable and equal parental leave policies that allow everyone in the organization to spend time with their, with, with their family versus just one gender. Right. And, and what that does, and I'm, I'm drawing from my from my personal experience, what that does, my, my prior prof professional experience, what that does is that, you know, I've, I've had instances where um, some of my male colleagues who all of a sudden over, of course, in my in my previous uh, uh, organization were able to take four and a half months of paid parental leave. Right. And they turned around and they were like, I understand finally what it feels <laughs> like. I knew it theoretically. I'd seen my my partner go to experience this, but now having been in that seat of being able to take four and a half, you know, eighteen weeks of paid parental leave, I understand the stressors, the what weighs on your mind. Will I be promoted when I come back? Will my manager still be around? Will my job still exist? What will my bonus look like? You know, all of those things that you that that in the past mostly women have have experienced. So that builds empathy, right? That builds empathy and a level of understanding that didn't necessarily exist before. So when I go back to that graph, right, those are some of the reasons why we see, um, you know, women leave the, the workforce, right? But it's also because of unsupportive cultures. It's because of unsupportive managers. It's because people don't see them as as at the same level, right? How many times have you been in a meeting? I, I know for I have for sure where I've offered a piece of, you know, uh, an advice or an idea just to get spoken over or someone uh -huh. idea and then say it and repurpose it as their own. There are all of these things, you know, that happen micro and macro that live, that lead women to, to leave the workforce. And the other piece that I would say, if, if there truly was meritocracy, those numbers would not look like that. Those numbers would look absolutely different. So that's those are my two cents there. If I can build on your your two cents and then ask um, um, for uh, others to hop in, um, I I learned about an interesting policy in Germany, whereas whereby if you wanted to get additional time parental leave, it would be granted, but only if both parents, if there were two parents, um, took the leave. So um, again organizations need to understand that, yeah, you can put in supportive policies within your organization, but are you trying to support a, a societal situation that really doesn't work? Um, oh, can I ask you, you, you just asked a question. So somebody takes four and a half months off for parental leave. What is going to happen to their bonus? Do they get the full year bonus? Do they, you know, et cetera? That's an What's equitable? It's, you know, it's an organizational level decision, right? It's an organizational level decision on how they they allocate um, and distribute. Yeah. I don't think there's one one way of doing it. It depends on how the organization is structured, how their total rewards and a compensation philosophy is, yeah. is structured. So I wouldn't be able to uh, answer that for. Maybe I can I can jump in because this is also a concern which was you know we did focus group of women employees about what their concerns are about you know an inclusive organization and one of the topic which came up was this exactly where they say that if women go on maternity leave um, the perception sometimes is that they are penalized you know for being away for the so we are being very mindful of that and we make sure that this is not the case you know so women go on maternity leave but they are 
compensated as per their value, the contribution, what they have done, like any other organization, and just not because they are not present you know, during that period of time. So we are very mindful of it. And actually, during our compensation review, we pay special attention to it. And I think it's a very important point. You know. So you put the career path and the bonuses on hold during the time they're away. No, no, no. we don't. We don't. We have promoted people who have been on maternity leave also and given full bonuses, which they would get if they were also, you know, they were working, for example, not on oh. maternity leave. And we are oh, very particular wow. about it because I think women feel really that this is a hindrance because of a natural phenomena of maternity. They are penalized in organizations because of this. And that's one of the reasons we pay special attention to it because it's a very important topic. It really feels... It, it actually for women equality or gender equality, I think it's a very important point which all organizations should look at. So, Michael, if you want to hop in, now's a great time before I build on that with the COVID question and hybrid workplaces and DEI. Well, I'm very interested to see the question about the, the COVID issue and, uh, you know, the disproportionate, I think, effect that it's had on women, because I was going to also make reference to that in the next panel discussion, because I think it's absolutely key. So I'll probably set that to one side for a moment. But just reflecting on what you, what you mentioned, um, when I think of two, two significant women in, in my life, well, I probably should mention a third, my wife, but setting her aside for a minute, um, my mother and my daughter um, separated by decades in terms of their um, active role in the workplace. My mother was a, a reporter on a local newspaper. Um, she became subject to um, a, a sort of target of vilification because the editor wanted to bring, hi, bring in his young niece to replace my mother. So if, you, if anybody was under any doubt as to how old gaslighting is in terms of um, the kind of um, attacks that women have to put up with in the workplace. It's been happening for a very long time. And, you know, it destroyed her um, her confidence to actually get a, another job um, somewhere else. And sadly, my father, who's also from a sort of traditional background, I think he didn't provide the kind of support that he might have done to sort of help her through. So a couple of things there. I think one significant other needs to be there also to help and to support people through difficult times. And then when I think of well, my you daughter you've got to be able now, to hire it in. There are, well, there are countries that will let you have home help. There's some that are set up with great services like the U.S. Somebody's got to help. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I was going to say my daughter is uh, is based in Mississippi now, and her, her, her little son, our grandson, is uh, uh, one year old today, actually. Um, and I just marvel at how she manages to balance a full-time job um, as a journalist while looking after Henry. Her husband is a is a vice principal in a, in a local school, and yet somehow it still seems that his job is more important than hers somehow. Funny enough, I, it, yeah. Anyway, I don't, I, I, maybe yeah. we're making some Good progress, question. but there's still there's still a long, long way to go. Absolutely. If, if Mokta, you looked like you want to say something. I was going to hit everybody. Yeah, with the COVID, you know, I wanted to just uh, because there are some comments I was reading, and then there was this, you know, the point when I was talking about unsupported manager, and and some of them have, uh, some of the people have written that there should be. Uh, skip level meeting, etc. And I think it, it's definitely true. What I was talking about was my personal experience. But yes, as an organization, I think it's important that people speak up. And nowadays with the, you know, whistle blowing, etc. There are a lot of people who are speaking up about behaviors, which are frankly not acceptable in organizations. And we do see uh, that um, uh, uh, we as an organization, we are actually quite intolerant of that kind of a behavior. But it becomes sometimes also difficult for people to change. I've also seen that even if you give warning, etc., sometimes it's not that easy to change the behavior. And employees, in the meanwhile, by the time the person is changing their behavior, they leave, you know, or they become yeah. frustrated, etc. So that yeah. happens. But uh, valid point in the comments, and thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Absolutely. So now uh, we were we were talking also about. Um, so we were talking about the. Stuff outside the organization, you know, does it encourage, does it inhibit? One of the things that we've noticed with COVID and hybrid work and moving now back to the um, physical workplace, 
uh, and how to integrate hybrid workforces and so forth. Uh, managers still do tend to promote if they see you in the office five days a week. Ooh, ooh, but wait, wait. A big percentage of workers will leave if you don't give them any flexibility. And who wants the flexibility most? Actually, women are, are women and the minority racial groups are the ones who most want the flexibility to work from home. So does that mean that you're going to exacerbate an already bad situation? Um, and to, to tag on to that, I've noticed that, yes, a lot of women want the flexibility of work from home, except if they're in India. Because what happens is, the doorbell rings, it's starting to rain and somebody's got to go up and get the, the laundry and, the, you know, the kids want something and it's mealtime, et cetera. And the expectation of the whole family is that the woman who's trying to work in her job from home will get up and take care of it and that the man won't. So there's a special story there for a racial group and women. Um, guys, what are people, individuals, and organizations supposed to do about hybrid work and making sure you can still get promoted? Um, you know, the approach that we've we've taken at uh, at Ubisoft, my 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 organization, um, is is one where we're we're testing and we're learning. This is this is still you know we've 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 kind of come out of the pandemic. We still don't you know cases are still on the rise. We're trying to live life like it's it's normal, um, but it's still really a test and learn approach. We've uh, we've given a lot of flexibility. We're a fairly large organization with with offices and studios you know across thirty five different different countries, um, and 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 we've really left that decision of what the what the balance looks like at, at, a, at a local uh, level. Um, but our main philosophy is 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 flexibility, right? We really believe in uh, I think one thing that we've all learned from from the pandemic is people like the flexibility, right? We've we've figured out a new balance in, in our lives and, and many people appreciate it. Um, women, men, um, you know, non-binary individuals, the LGBTQ plus communities, neurodiverse communities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think everyone's kind of figured out um, for themselves what that what 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 good looks like in this in this new normal for for them. What what I think is really interesting as we enter this this phase of things are open, we're able to move around more freely than we were, um, you know, six to eight months ago. Um, thinking about oneself as an individual is great, but what does that, what does, what's the impact of that on a team, right? Because at the end of the day, most of us are doing works, work in teams, right? And, and we're, we're trying to create and build as a team. So we're trying to figure out, especially as a creative company that makes makes video games and in the creative process, it's, it's quite important oftentimes to have those, those big brainstorm sessions where you're ideating and you're creating and you're developing and you're designing, we're trying to figure out what does that balance look like between hybrid and in-person in -person time. There's, there is something magical, you know, when you come together in, in a group and are able to discuss and debate and, and, and ideate. But we also know that there's something really special of, uh, you know, with, with the flexibility that we've all We've all gotten used to, and I think you raise a good point, right? I think everyone's personal lives are are, are different. I, I I don't think it's just India, but people do live in multi generational families with with different needs. Um, some people live all by themselves with with different needs. So I think you know we ha we we acknowledge as as organizations that there is no one norm anymore, uh, which is which is what the past uh, you know pre pandemic used to be. Um, for us, uh, I'm, and I completely agree with Rashi, it's a question of flexibility that we give to the employees. Um, for us, I think we are, we are present in 12 markets in APAC, and we do see some differences in terms of preference. But uh, overall, I think uh, both males and females, they really... Um, they value the flexibility which is given to them. And I think the the underlying feature for any of this hybrid work 
to be successful is is the trust between the managers and the employees and if that is not there frankly it's not going to work uh, for us we provide two days uh, work from home for most of our departments we do have some regulated departments so we need to be careful on that part however uh, majority is two days work from home in apac uh, uh, and and it is really working very well and people really like that flexibility not the thing that you have to do it but they have the choice to take you know two days of work from home uh, it is working well actually and i think this is going to be the norm anyway uh, going forward yeah. CJ, I might jump in with a comment just to sort of say, you know, pre-COVID, um, I think we were making some progress towards what you might call flexible working. And there were different sort of aspects of flexible working. You could have job shares, you could have, um, you know, compressed days, you could have, um, you know, job rotations or sabbaticals, a whole range of different things that were wrapped underneath that rubric of flexible working. And one of the things I suppose we have to guard against is that, and I welcome the fact that we've got um, hybrid working and that it gives individuals flexibility. I think that's great. But it would be really good to know that other forms of flexible working would not be, as it were, brushed under the carpet because people simply say, hey, you've got hybrid working, you know, be happy, um, that we should also be promoting some other aspects of um, flexible working so that other people can, um, can perhaps access the workplace as well. Um, underrepresented minorities, for example. Um, Rashi mentioned um, neurodiverse um, members of the community. It would be wonderful if we could find better ways to, you know, um, invite them into the workplace as well and help them to find a home so that they they can also enjoy you know some some self-esteem brilliant i love that and we've got so many comments and questions i'd like to share some of what our uh listeners are telling us um one uh sonia sant has mentioned that uh the media highlights that dni lags in apac um if any of you want to address that after I, I share some questions and some ideas. Pearly Tan has shared with us that um, in organizations where there are unsupportive or possibly biased managers, there needs to be some 360 reviews um, so we can avoid the culture of people pleasing, include the peer reviews, all of that. She also adds that um, skip level meetings on a regular basis should also help with some of those things. And you need to just sometimes stand up for yourself and um, put your foot down, make a fuss if something is unfair. Um, that was from Vajianti Bagwe. Um, one of the major drivers for decisions is financial trade-off involved. Um, the gender pay gap is important. Um, in terms of female career longevity. Um, we need to think about some other changes that might be on the critical path to success. Um, one of our earlier topics that we were going to discuss before we were almost ran out of time, we've got about three minutes left, um, are women over mentored but under sponsored? Everybody seems to want to mentor women, but are we really sponsored uh, and is there anybody up higher in the organization willing to say, yeah, promote this person, let's give them uh, a chance. Positive discrimination. Mukta brought up an instance in companies that have quotas and you're a woman who just got promoted. And somebody comes up to you and says, oh, so you're one of the positive discrimination quota people, aren't you? What do you do about that? I think uh, so. Yeah. So this is the this is a burning topic, you know, where uh, uh, we have to. I mean, we, I'm in financial industries, and the fact is that we do have less women uh, at uh, at senior levels. And and frankly, it's not only in APAC. Uh, it is actually across the world, uh, where you have in financial services managing directors there are less women than men. And we saw what uh, CJ what you showed, you know, the graph which was going down. I think it is very much representative of uh, financial industry, especially investment banking, uh, you know, so if you look at it. So, yes, I think uh, we do have questions when there are women who are promoted. Uh, and and the, the, the answer that we give them is that if, first of all, the women that we put up for promotion, 
they are the ones whom people who are qualified you know they are they are doing well they are they have the credentials you know they are performing on a consistent basis so i think one of them is that that we should not put up anybody who is for example not qualified if you are promoting women just to tick the box then i think it creates a problem of this positive discrimination but if women are qualified and all then there are people who will say that yeah i think the person should be a managing director however because there are such limited seats sometimes these kind of questions do come that it's a diversity promotion you know and it's not something which is there mm. which is there it's a perception the the main thing what we do is that we of course speak to the to the males that are there you know who are feeling this and the credentials of the women their performance actually speaks for themselves so we have to be very careful when we are putting up the nominees for promotions to actually quell you know this perception of uh, positive discrimination it's a very difficult subject uh, and and i i'm not saying that we are 100% successful in it but um, it, and these are the things which will come up more and more again so we need to be careful as organizations about these uh, perceptions yeah. so if i understand correctly we started late so I, may I ask for one final word of advice from each of these two ladies and Michael, I'm sure, can give his word of advice in the next session. Ken? Mike Rosenthal? Okay, okay. Mukta and Rashi, Michael, you'll give some advice in the next session. What are your final words of advice for individuals and organizational leaders to have a diverse uh, senior management level, one that includes women. I would say take chances with unconventional choices, you know, when you are uh, looking at key people. Beautiful. I think for, for individuals, I would say, um, remember that you have transferable skills. So not everything is gonna be like for like. So remember that your skills are what counts. So leverage that. The, the second would be remember that you have a voice and your voice matters and it counts. And don't be afraid to use it, right? Oftentimes we, we're scared when it comes to networking or asking for something or asking for a connection. Use your voice, share your perspectives. It is extremely, extremely important. 